um, it's always good to be back at BIC uh, and especially in person doing an event after more than a year feels fabulous. It is again, uh, if I may reiterate what Ravi said, a privilege and an honor to be in conversation with you, Dr. Srinivasan today. Um, again, as Ravi said, your career and your story is synonymous with the journey of India's nuclear energy program. There is a richness there which many of us do not have access to. I've had the privilege of earlier having met you once or twice and heard some of the stories myself from you. But I think it would be wonderful if we are able to today evening share that experience and bring some of that, uh, some of the details, some of the richness, some of the, um, you know, the trials and travails of what it has meant to have a nuclear energy program, what it has meant to establish one and, and maintain one in this country. But before we go to that story, may I ask you to tell us or share with us a little bit about what brought you eventually to the motivation where you joined India's nuclear program, so to speak. So, you know, what is it that you did before that and then you found yourself working? Well, uh, Johnny, actually what happened is the following. And after I had done my engineering in Bangalore, from the college in Bangalore, and mechanical engineering, I was trying to plan to go abroad to pursue further studies. And that was in the, in the, I had finished my graduation in 1950, it's a long time ago. And then um, in the, during the time I was exploring options of going overseas for further studies, uh, I, took a, I took some short-term assignments uh, with Damodar Valley Corporation in Calcutta and later on with the Defense Science Organization in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And these were, as it were, filling in time, uh, uh, pending a suitable opportunity for me to go overseas. Now, in those days, the advanced technology areas in engineering uh, at least in my area, I mean, this were really gas turbines and jet propulsion technology. Mm -hmm. That is what's used for um, powering jet aircraft, which is in the infancy. And so I got an opportunity to study that field uh, in Canada under a scholarship from the Canadian government under the Congo plan. Mm -hmm. So actually, I initially went to Canada, to McGill University in Montreal, and did my master's and uh, PhD degrees there. Of course, during that period, we had a, an Englishman who had come over from the UK who had worked in the early part of the British nuclear energy program. And he gave a course of lectures um, on nuclear technology, uh, introductory course as it was. Now, of course, I had uh, heard Dr. Baba speak as the president of the Indian National Science, Indian Science Congress yes. in 1951, early in Bangalore itself. And um, so I was actually quite uh, interested in uh, this new frontier technology. Then after I finished up in Canada with my degree, I took up a position in, in the UK mm -hmm. in an industry making industrial gas turbines. And during that period, Dr. Baba had been chosen to head the uh, Department of Atomic Energy when he just set up. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for young people who had specialized in any of the newer areas of engineering and technology and science to express an interest in order to work in the newly set up organization. And so I responded and it happened that I was selected. And so I was very happy to have an opportunity to work on uh, the uh, nuclear energy activities. And when I came back to India in early 1950, uh, um, <coughs> it was in 1956, um, early I came back, I joined the department in 1955, mm -hmm. uh, in September in the, in the UK. My first assignment to work on the uh, first uh, research reactor called Apsara. So that uh, in the construction of that reactor, and I was a member of a small team of people that has worked with uh, Dr. Baba and his leadership on building that reactor. And so my interest in nuclear, engine, uh, nuclear energy activities got excited. 
I'm going to continue there on and uh, as it were, I stayed on with the organization from then on till I finished up uh, in a formal way in 1990. So that's the way it was. And I found the activity perfectly uh, satisfying, interesting, challenging, and uh, had the companionship of many very competent uh, scientists, technologies, um, uh, people with broad ranges of interest, and so forth. So that's the way it turned out. So it's a, it's it's a coincidence uh, in a way that you know you you return to india to join the program but also this is just around the first atoms for peace conference in 1955 when sort of the international doors to um, uh, having nuclear energy programs or having reactors in the first instance uh, began to happen in a, in a, in a in a broader way than it did say in the period between 40, 45 and 55 so the first 10 years being sort of you know more strict um, embargo on knowledge sharing. Um, what would you say was the nature of India's nuclear ambition when Apsara went critical in 1956? It's, how did you perceive it from the inside? Well, Apsara by itself was really in a sense a baby step, you can say, because it was a, a experimental reactor uh, meant to provide uh, neutron beams for experimentation in nuclear physics, uh, shielding studies, uh, studies to do with uh, nuclear chemistry, uh, isotope production and things like that. So this is a, a small, uh, as it were, uh, start. But the expectation at that point of time was that uh, nuclear energy, which had got associated in the public mind with the uh, weapon development of the, the United States, followed by Soviet Union, that there was a potential for peaceful applications in many areas which would benefit mankind, including, of course, energy production and applications in uh, uh, the field of uh, medicine for uh, therapeutics and diagnostics. And then uh, uh, also, uh, uh, in uh, use of the radiation, other industrial activities. So there was the expectation that uh, a lot of new opportunities arise in this field. And so uh, the initial start was Apsara. But of course, it was only going to be the initial first step. So you just started listing them. Maybe could you tell us the gamut of activities, the departments or the other activities that opened up around Apsara? Well, uh, around Apsara, the other activities that brought up was the setting up of uh, various laboratories for uh, physics and chemistry, metallurgy, chemical engineering, electronics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all the, uh, including of course, study of uh, biology in terms of uh, effect of radiation on uh, living tissue and so on. So all of these things needed to be set up. So the big activity was really the um, uh, fairly large scale recruitment of uh, scientific personnel and their orientation towards uh, utilization in the nuclear activities. So, I mean, I think what this tells us is how, how foundational these activities were and, you, and how, in a way, your association with the in nuclear program in India or the nuclear energy program in India has been right, pretty much right since the outset. Um, how critical was help from countries like the United States or Canada for launching these activities and what role did they play, especially in the, in the sort of, you know, slightly thawed environment, geopolitical environment that we found ourselves in after 55? Well, of course, we had assistance for, uh, for building Apsara hmm. from the United Kingdom. They, they had uh, supplied the initial fuel charge for the reactor and on a lease basis. So that was the initial start. Uh, and in those days, uh, uh, the intention that there would be uh, wide scale international cooperation in nuclear energy was a hope, but uh, 
Nevertheless, all these countries who are looking at their programs as uh, very, very much national programs and uh, uh, the access to other countries were on a more a restrictive basis at the time, in the, in the early days. Hmm. Uh, and so the emphasis was on growing science and technology within the country. So, you know, since uh, since 45, uh, we've been aware that anyone who can basically put a pile or a reactor together, anyone who can, anyone as in any country or any group that can do that kind of work can also build a bomb. And so the, there was all nuclear energy activities in many ways were carried out in the shadow of the bomb, right? Like in a sense, there, there, was, a, there was a long shadow of 45 that was, that, that was left on nuclear energy work. How aware were the people around you, the new recruits, for example, into the, into the uh, nuclear energy program of this duality? And did that create, um, or in a sense, how did that affect the working environment? How, how, how did people deal with it? Well, I think we were all largely uh, concerned with uh, uh, growing nuclear science and technology in the broader sense yeah. for energy production. And uh, the uh, prospect of uh, any strategic intentions were, uh, as it were, uh, might have been very much uh, out in the future because you see, um, the, the, we were aware that uh, this, is a, this is the kind of technology which each country looked, up, looked after as its own. And that uh, uh, it would be presumptuous to expect anyone to help any other country mm. in this matter. So I think the intention was to grow our own science and technology and uh, have, a, 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 in fact, a high measure of independence in nuclear matters. So as you indicated, Apsara was an experimental uh, reactor. Um, it, it gave a kickstart to the activities that you later got involved in. So could you walk us through the processes of selecting reactors after Apsara? Because that is when the real program, in a sense, you know, started taking root. You took various directions. So I'm, the reason why I ask this is I'm reminded here of stories of how uh, Indian scientific establishment as well as political establishment negotiated with various countries, you know, irrespective of blocks. So whether we look at the kind of steel plants that were put in India, you know, by the Germans, by the Americans, by the Soviets, similarly for, for the IITs. So was there something of this, was there some awareness of this kind while selecting reactors, those that were acquired from outside? And how, how, how were these reactors, in a way, selected? What, how, what were the criteria? How did you go about it? Well, you see, the, we had initially uh, uh, looked at the nuclear resource situation in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, that uh, indicated that we had some amount of uranium, mm -hmm. not a large amount, but some amount of uranium, of somewhat low uh, grade, as we call it. Uh, but we had uranium to an extent, and um, the most of the reactors that were, had then been built or were proposed to be built in, for power production at any rate were using enriched uranium. That is, uranium is processed uh, to in, enrich the fissile component. There are two components in uranium: uranium 238 and uranium 235. Yeah. The 235 component is the fissile component. And one has to enrich that to a certain extent to be able to use it in a reactor using uh, ordinary water for that matter, or it's called light water, not yeah. just ordinary plain water, but it is high grade processed uh, pure water. Uh, and there was another possibility that is to use reactors that use natural uranium uh, without requiring this enrichment process. And um, our intention initially was that, that we should build those that didn't require enrichment because we didn't have an enrichment capability at that point of time. Mm. And so we had thought in terms of uh, natural reactors and those were in, uh, at that game point of time being developed in Britain and France. 
Now, <clears throat> yeah, our intention was that initially would have the reactors that you use natural uranium, then they would be followed by what are called the fast reactors, <laughs> which use the plutonium that produces a byproduct in these first generation reactors, and that they would eventually be able to make a nuclear fuel out of thorium. Hmm. So that's called thorium two, the uranium 233. Well, that was our initial uh, line of thinking. And that, that's still, in a sense, a long-term objective of our program to be able to use thorium as an energy base uh, over a period of time. Hmm. But the, when we went in for uh, 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 the natural nitrate reactors, we also had the opportunity of building with Canada research reactor, hmm. uh, which is called Cyrus, uh, which is a larger reactor than Apsara. And that was constructed for purposes of, again, nuclear research, hmm. material studies, uh, isotope production, and so forth. So that was uh, the next uh, important reactor that was built in the Indian uh, program. Hmm. And um, then when we were looking at the possibilities of power production. Um, we, we went for uh, international tenders for the first nuclear power station when we had taken a decision sometime towards 1958, 59 to go ahead with our first nuclear power station. We went ahead with international tenders. And so we received uh, bids both based on natural reactors and industrial reactors. Mm. And we found that the industrial reactors were much more economic to build and operate and uh, compared to the reactors on offer from UK and France. So that's how we opted for the light water reactor that we built in Tarapur yeah. at that point of time. Now, over a period of time, it has turned out insofar as power production is concerned, large number of reactors in the world today are really water reactors. Uh, uh, earlier on, to an extent, developed both in the US and uh, USSR for some marine application, but then uh, extrapolated for civilian uses. Hmm. So they're the ones that are the mainline reactors. Now, there are a small, small number of other experimental reactors which are also looking at the prospect of uh, fast reactors for power production as a part of a longer term objective to utilize the fuel resources in a more efficient manner. Mm -hmm. That is, when we say fuel resources, the uh, reactors of the use, there is still quite a bit of fissile content in the spent fuel. And uh, by recycling them, we get more energy output from the given amount of naturally occurring uranium or eventually thorium. So I think for uh, those who might not be aware, th the, the uh, thorium sands or monazite sands in Kerala uh, found in what was then the kingdom of Travancore, uh, uh, just around independence, was, a, was, a, was, a, was an important moment because at that point of time, I think monazite sands or naturally occurring thorium was found only in two or three places. I think it was Canada and um, uh, in, and Travancore in, in 46, 47. I think later probably that that widened a little bit. But I think that will be interesting to our audiences. Um, and alongside that, for those who have not seen, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation produced a very, uh, which I'm sure you and your colleagues have seen several times, a, a very lovely film about uh, you know the the journey of the Tarapur reactor from the coast to the place where it was eventually installed. And it's actually, it's- Well, um, the, 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 the monazite sands have been used to produce a certain amount of uranium in the early stages of the program, but yeah. subsequently it's uh, more the uranium bearing ores in uh, uh, Jharkhand that have been used for yes. the uranium production. Yes. The monazite is processed for other applications, rare earths, and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think we had at that point, at least, if I remember correctly, uh, collaboration with the French uh, for processing rare earths. 
That was a, we had an early collaboration with France and the setting up of the Indian Dairies plant. Yes. Very early, but subsequently it's been um, done very much uh, on an independent basis. Independently, yeah. And I think so, you know, this brings me to that moment where, you know, this independence in a sense or um, uh, became necessary. So uh, it's a question that I was hoping to ask later, but I think it makes sense here, which is the what have been called the peaceful nuclear explosions of, uh, you know, or the tests of 1974 brought with it uh, uh, embargoes, but brought it brought with it a lot of restrictions in sharing of knowledge and materials from the rest of the world to India at a moment when the energy program was taking off. And that had consequences, which meant, you know, exactly as you said, uh, uh, the program had to go more independent. Would it, so, you know, in a sense, my, my question would be, would the nuclear energy, it's a counterfactual as a historian, I'm not supposed to ask this question, but would progress on the energy program have gone differently if, 19, if the tests of 1974 were not conducted? Well, you see, you've got to bear in mind one thing that uh, in the early days when uh, uh, the US or the USSR or Britain or even to an extent later on France joined the so-called nuclear club, they were all far away from uh, India's uh, immediate uh, neighborhood in terms of uh, uh, geopolitical uh, implications. But of course, the uh, Chinese uh, nuclear test in 1964 uh, brought uh, very close to our own uh, borders the uh, emergence of a, a nuclear weapon state because they had also uh, very definitely announced their intention to have an active weapons program from the very beginning. That was their objective. And of course, they had uh, followed up with other uh, weapon states. So I think to an extent, the uh, strategic sensitivities uh, uh, were sensitized. And uh, therefore, uh, there was a nat national feeling that uh, perhaps we should uh, also uh, uh, demonstrate to ourselves and to the world that uh, we are also capable of having a test. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was what happened in 1974. Yes, there was the question of embargoes and uh, it did impact on the uh, power programs that we had embarked upon. Mm -hmm. But the uh, 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 consequence of that was it spurred on India to uh, develop its own capabilities in an uh, independent manner much earlier than might have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it's of course possible to argue that uh, uh, the uh, co cooperation projects would have run smoother, but uh, this happened to be an issue that uh, was very much uh, a matter that we had to reckon with and allow for and plan you know, activities. So, could you explain possibly in some detail, how is a site for a reactor selected? Because this is not something, you know, that we hear of or are aware of in day-to-day -day life. Now, those who are deeply involved in learning about nuclear energy or observe the nuclear energy scene would know more about it. But I think in everyday life, we are generally not, we are, we are not privy to the knowledge of how a site is selected, what are the criteria that you bear in mind, but also how the process by which a decision then is arrived at that, you know, this is, this is a good location, even if not ideal to host um, a reactor. You see, there are uh, a number of uh, considerations that, uh you need uh, to take into account uh, in arriving at a site. Uh, first of all, of course, there's a whole lot of uh, uh, requirements which are purely from an engineering point of view, like good foundation conditions, yeah. availability of cooling water, or the power stations required to dissipate uh, a certain amount of waste heat, which is inherent in all um, 
thermal processes for producing electricity, you've got to be able to dissipate heat. And uh, one of the ways is to either a, a stream nearby or in a lake or into the sea. Into the sea. Uh, then you require a location where, from where the power that you produce can be transmitted quite conveniently to the system, power system with minimum um, losses and uh, maximum reliability. And then of course, uh, we look for uh, sites with a very low population uh, density if possible with very little population altogether because we would like to be able to take control of the site fully so that we don't have people living within the uh, nuclear complex at some safe distance away from the complex. Of course, we go over the um, earthquake history in an extremely great manner because that's very important. The question is the uh, seismic characteristic of the site. Mm -hmm. So you've got to go through the geological history about uh, earthquakes that might have taken place there or in the neighborhood, what their intensity was, and uh, be sure that you allow for uh, the appropriate safety factors in the design of the structures of the uh, nuclear installation, because we want to make absolutely certain that none of the nuclear equipment or any associated auxiliary equipment would fail uh, and subsequently, in addition, of course, on top of all these things, you have at all of the nuclear installations uh, seismic sensors, yeah. which are also there to switch the units off in case of a seismic disturbance beyond a certain level, what's called as a um, safe design-based earthquake. So these are all the factors. And of course, for the sites located on the coast, we go over the tsunami history in a very careful manner. So it's carried out by an interdisciplinary group of people, expertise with all the uh, uh, groups, and a lot of the input data coming from the states where the locations are there. And uh, a very thorough assessment is made, and then only the sites are uh, selected. Of course, I'd like to say that uh, sites that were selected in the early days have all proved to be very good. The one at Tarapur, or the one at um, Rajasthan, and the one in Kalpakam, and even the Kudankulam site is a very, very good site. And so for that matter, Kaiga. Well, there is always a public issue. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a public concern whether there's going to be an impact on the uh, flora and fauna, or the people there, and so on. So I remember myself participating in a long discussions along with my colleagues. Uh, in Bangalore about the location of the Kaiga site. Mm. And uh, it has turned out to be a very good site and our reactors there are operating very well. They produce power at uh, optimum uh, capacities and uh, in a very reliable manner. But of course, we've got to make sure that this process is transparent, mm. that we uh, assure the public that uh, the concerns are uh, addressed and uh, they're satisfactorily addressed to. Mm -hmm. um, at what point in history did India become capable of designing and producing her own reactors? Well, you see, after two collaborative projects, the first with the United States to build our Tarapur station with two American design reactors and two Canadian react design reactors in Rajasthan, we took a decision that we would then move uh, on our own steam at that point of time. And so the reactors at Madras were designed and built on our own, uh, using all equipment that was manufactured within the country. The detailed designs also being evolved here. All the, many of the special materials also were produced from within the country. So uh, we had started the work on the Madras reactors in the early part of the 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first unit went into operation in 1983. So it might say from early 80, we were in a position to uh, design and build our own power reactors. Mm -hmm. 
course, we are also in the interim built uh, some research uh, reactors to the, for our the applications. So that was uh, the way the uh, capability got built up. So I think we did manage to uh, achieve uh, a high level of uh, self-reliance fairly early on in the game. And subsequently, we took on designing a number of uh, heavy water reactors, which were built in various like, different locations in India. Apart from Kalpakam, we went built reactors in Narora and Uttar Pradesh, in Kakrapara and Gujarat, in Kaiga, mm. expansion projects in Rajasthan, and uh, uh, and and uh, we scaled up the size from 230 megawatts initially to 540 megawatts, and now we are uh, we have scaled up further to 700 megawatts. Mm. Uh, our first 700 megawatt uh, heavy water reactor for our own design has just uh, been made functional in Kakarapara huh? as a new unit. And a number of those reactors are following thereafter. And sometime a couple of years ago, we took a decision to build about 10 of these reactors in a fleet mode hmm. as one package. So um, I remember interesting stories from the days when the variable energy cyclotron Center, mm -hmm. the, the variable energy cyclotron center, when they tried to produce their own cyclotron, uh, they tried to build the cyclotron from scratch in India. And I remember stories of how when they tried to build a shielding, uh, working with shipbuilders and the welding was done by the shipbuilders, but it was still not good enough for the particle accelerator and it bulged. So I'm just, the reason to bring up this story is to ask you, are there interesting stories in this process of becoming um, capable of producing reactors on our own. So were there stories where, you know, specific challenges had to be overcome in terms of production because industrial support for preci precision manufacturing in India has had its own sort of checkered history. Well, you see, the, for the cyclotron itself, we, uh, which was built eventually yes. in Calcutta, the very energy cyclotron, the... Uh, magnet pieces were all fabricated in India, yeah. in Bhopal. Yeah. Now, in the uh, manufacture of many of these components for nuclear applications, there have been many, many challenges in terms of special materials, in terms of special techniques of uh, uh, fabrication, high precision, and, uh, you know, magnetic characteristics being assured. Mm. All these things, there, there, there have been many challenges, wide-ranging ones, across a whole host of issues that have been addressed to. And this is where the very strong interdisciplinary uh, knowledge base that has been evolved in uh, Trombe initially and subsequently in the other nuclear establishments uh, that is in Kalpakam and in Indore and elsewhere uh, has been of a great uh, uh, value for the country uh, to, to, to be able to make all these extremely complex components to very high uh, levels of precision and high levels of ex performance, mm -hmm. high vacuum levels and high leak tightness and all of that. Mm -hmm. any, any specific or singular story that stands out to you or which, which felt at that moment was a massive well, I mean, In recent times, one of the big achievements has been, for instance, the uh, the cryogenic uh, mm -hmm. uh, tank for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, uh, which uh, India is a partner. There are a number of other, uh, there are other people like, yeah, they, you know, there, there are a number of people, that is United States, uh, Russia, European Union, Japan, uh, China, and Korea, and now India has also joined. Uh, this, uh, the thermonuclear experimental reactor is being set up in France as a part of this joint program. Mm. And for that, a very important component called the cryostat, mm. that is a cold chamber yeah. at uh, liquid helium temperature has been fabricated in India. The material also has been produced in India and fabricated in India by one of our leading engineering companies. So. 
such challenges have been there. This is, of course, uh, one of the, uh, shall we say, crowning achievements, but there are many, many others along in the program. So, which also raises the question of manpower and training, right? It, uh, when, uh, from my own research in experimental, or beginnings of experimental nuclear physics in India, uh, there weren't that many people in the 40s who were able to do this kind of work, be it in nuclear engineering or nuclear sciences. But uh, by the 1950s and after, uh, there were a number of people, including some who were trained abroad. So I was wondering what role cooperation and collaboration played in enabling India to, to sort of have a skilled, um, you know, skilled team, skilled people to do this work. And to what extent was this, this training also homegrown? Well, you see, in the early days, uh, some uh, number of people have uh, 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 gone abroad and participated in the uh, in, in the activities of uh, other nuclear establishments. Hmm. Uh, but thereafter, we placed a great deal of emphasis on producing our own uh, scientific and technological manpower. For which purpose we set up this uh, training school in Trombe, which has been producing very competent uh, engineers and scientists uh, uh, in different disciplines, physics, chemistry, metallurgy, and a different branch of engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical instrumentation, chemical engineering, and so forth. And all these people are uh, initially trained in uh, the training school, training establishment in Trombe, and then uh, used on the projects to acquire on the job expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, that has been one of the important uh, uh, manpower banks. And then subsequently, we have also been training people in special areas like reactor operations or radiation protection or chemical plant operations and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, um, this has received a great deal of training. We also assisted in training tech, uh, technical personnel in the use of radiation for uh, medical and diagnostic purposes, for industrial radiography. So this has been a very uh, big program of manpower training. Uh, now, industry uh, which has participated with us, they then impart training for welders in special materials, mm -hmm. for example, in, uh, uh, in the non-destructive testing activities. And so the whole environment of creating an industrial, nu nuclear industrial culture has been nurtured over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think we have done quite well in that uh, process, which we can in fact support a larger nuclear activity also. Have we trained people from other countries in our Oh, facilities? yes. Well, we have received people from some of the uh, uh, neighboring countries uh, in earlier times, like some people from Indonesia and Philippines mm -hmm. uh, and uh, other such uh, neighboring countries have come and received uh, uh, training uh, opportunities in India. And now we know we also have set up in uh, uh, a place in, in Haryana, uh, a global nuclear energy partnership center, mm -hmm. uh, where we are taking people from the neighboring countries and imparting uh, courses in uh, uh, nuclear safety, radiation protection, use of radiation, and such activities. There's an ongoing uh, separate activity has been going on. Okay. So, you know, like, like it was elsewhere, so this wasn't uh, unique to India, uh, facilities for uh, like nuclear research facilities and energy uh, program have been concentrated, centralized. And of course, large, not largely, but enti almost entirely under the control of um, the, the, the state, so to speak, right? Uh, would this, given what we just spoke about training, would this have in some way benefited if some resources were also pumped into universities to cultivate research and education programs in nuclear sciences and engineering. 
You see, in the early phases of the program, uh, it is must recognize that uh, nuclear activities require a very strong infrastructure, which is uh, uh, rather specialized. I mean, just to give you an example, you know, uh, when you have laboratories that handle nuclear materials, you require to have very strict control of ventilation, uh, people's personal protection, because what you are now reading about all these virus related activities for that matter. You see, these are all experiences that we have gone through a long, long time ago. Uh, and uh, uh, even such things starting from extremely reliable power supplies uh, to ventilation equipment to, to uh, supply of other inputs required for nuclear activities, they're all, uh, uh, so they were in those early days very specialized and uh, quite expensive investments. Mm -hmm. So it would have been difficult at that point of time for India to have dispersed all these activities mm -hmm. around. And much like so the other larger countries found it advantageous to set up centralized facilities, that's the way, that's the path we also went. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as we have gone along, we have tried to disperse the uh, uh, activities to the extent possible, wherever there's an interest uh, uh, available and partnership is possible, that we encourage and that is going to be encouraged quite actively even in future. So, may I ask you to say a little bit, because, you know, your, your career spans this, the period of, of the Cold War and detente and, you know, post-Cold War. What was the specific nature of India's relationship to the United States on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other hand in matters of nuclear cooperation collaboration? Well, um, uh, you see, the, 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 you see, you must remember that uh, starting from 1968, uh, when uh, the United States start, along with uh, Soviet Union and uh, UK, started to push through the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, relationship that India had with these countries to an extent uh, became, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, cold because India felt that uh, we cannot give up our right to uh, national security, and that uh, uh, while, of course, we had not any weapons program at the time, we felt that uh, it was an, an unfair situation to have the world divided into two blocks, the nuclear halves and nuclear non-halves. Mm. So India stood out of the non-proliferation treaty on this one number of countries or a period of time that stood out of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. So to an extent, you can say it was a little frosty, but at the same time, uh, the other uh, countries also realized that uh, uh, being a large sovereign nation, we, we have uh, perhaps our own compulsions to keep our options. So yes, uh, uh, there was always this subject coming up for discussion all the time, but India kept saying that it had its own uh, uh, concerns, which it had to keep in mind and could not be barked away. So what, in your opinion, changed by the Indo-US, by the time the Indo-US nuclear deal was signed? Well, you know, the, the world now is that uh, there are so many, I mean, there are, uh, there is now a huge uh, disequilibrium in the situation with regard to nuclear weapon capabilities. But um, uh, India continues to believe that the right thing would be to have uh, no nuclear weapons with anybody if that uh, uh, situation were to be achieved at any point of time. Hmm. That no country should have nuclear weapons, but uh, everyone should be uh, living in peace with one another. That would be ideal, yes. So coming back to nuclear energy, India's goal for the nuclear energy program was ambitious right from the start. The goal was to go, well, 
almost like France to the extent that one could take it and you know integrate it into our other energy sources. Uh, the delivery has been, as we all agree, slower than expected. Might you be able to share with us your assessment of what were the what were the concerns and what were the challenges that came along in the way for um, for this, in a way, underperformance? You see, the, there are a number of issues that uh, have conditioned uh, uh, the nuclear program to the world as a whole, if you can make out. Uh, in some countries, large amounts of investment were made quite early on in building reactors to a standardized design and uh, then derive benefits of uh, standardization and quick construction and, and, and uh, build them uh, in a rapid manner, France being one example. The United States also built a number of nuclear power stations early on, but thereafter the, uh, uh, the pace, pace slowed down for various reasons, especially after uh, when their uh, reactors had an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, now, France built a very enviable program of repetitive uh, design, standardized design, and built uh, to tight time schedules and cost control. Now, in the Indian case, what has happened is that uh, uh, our uh, uh, desire to reach uh, localization across the board has been time consuming mm. because you know you have to start from scratch in some uh, respects. For example, if you have to make special materials like zirconium, uh, you first of all, you've got to go and look for the ore in the ores in the beach sands you know, remove all the nuclear poisons and then find out techniques of fabrication of, of smelting, fabrication, and all that. So all of this is time consuming. Nuclear equipment manufacturing has been time consuming. So it's been slower than anticipated. Then also India has the problem of uh, having to compete, the, uh, having to balance investments in uh, 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 nuclear power with other types of uh, technologies available. Uh, in other words, nuclear power is more capital intensive, mm -hmm. whereas it does give a benefit in terms of low energy, lower energy costs, nevertheless it's capital intensive. So there's only so much that you can afford to put in money. So that has also been a factor. Mm -hmm. So one could say, if I were to slightly take the question away from the nuclear and say one, in hindsight, one could say that at the end of the Second World War, more or less two roads appeared to industrial modernization. And one was the nuclear way, which offered the dual use technology, uh, which India chose. There was another one, which was that of semiconductors and electronics, which Japan and South Korea chose. A counterfactual again from a historian. Do you think we, uh, do you think India could have done differently in terms of industrial modernization if India went the semiconductor way or the electronics way? Or was this the right decision to take, in your opinion? You see, it's always difficult to um, cast, Of course. Uh, because there are so many factors that are at work uh, when any executive, executive decision has to be made. It's not that we are unaware of the importance of electronics. Hmm. As a matter of fact, I'd like to say that uh, uh, Dr. Baba himself chaired a committee on electronics, yes. uh, which looked at the situation of electronics development in the country at that point of time and charted out what should be the kind of plan of action. And then when Dr. Baba died in an untimely accident, air accident, that committee's work was then followed through by Dr. Sarabhai. Yeah. So they both had the envision that we should also be uh, not neglecting, but uh, develop uh, uh, the wherewithal to have uh, uh, progress in electronics manufacture, and hardware component manufacture, and all these things. Um, now, the nuclear activity had by then assumed a slightly larger dimension. So naturally, it, it took precedence in terms of utilization of manpower and resources. And um, the electronics 
uh, industry that was initially started off at that point. In fact, Atomic Energy itself started to make some of the components mm -hmm. in Hyderabad. But I think we were overtaken by technological progress in other parts of the world with large amounts of uh, uh, integrated circuits and so forth, which uh, got you know, uh, developed in other parts of the world in a highly economic manner. So to some extent, uh, that uh, initiative happened elsewhere and not in India. But of course, even now, it is relevant to say that we must uh, try and uh, catch up on electronics hardware manufacture. Uh, of course, by well, the strength in electronics and computer software in those areas, we also need to build up a viable electronics hardware industry. Otherwise, you see, right now the importation of electronics is very, very large fraction of our total imports. Hmm. And that we need to, to the extent possible, uh, manufacture in the country. So I'll bring China back in. In 1964, the Chinese tests brought the Indian uh, question on capability or strategic capability to the table. China entered the nuclear energy domain much later than India. Um, in the 90s, in fact, 91 is when they put their first reactor to a grid. And they seem to have, of course, gone into it full throttle. How do you see, given that, you know, even up until the 90s, I mean, well, up until the 80s, at least, there was, there was still some kind of, you know, hidden competition, that kind of watchful eye, etc. How do you compare the Indian and the Chinese situation on, on the nuclear energy question? Uh, earlier, but also now. So you could say, for instance, you know, we built our first pair of reactors within the operation in 1969. Yes. And the Chinese, on the other hand, since they were isolated, they built their own design, first design reactors, some 300, 350, 300 megawatts yeah. on their own uh, a bit later. But what happened is this, you see, that the Chinese economy, after it uh, entered the phase of uh, opening up mm -hmm. uh, and uh, becoming the uh, factory of the world, as it were, as yeah. an export powerhouse, uh, they had deep pockets. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also you must remember, because of the fact that they had become a nuclear weapon state under the non-proliferation treaty, they were in a position to import nuclear reactors from mm -hmm. other parts of the world. So the um, countries like France and you know, Russia or even the United States are quite uh, happy to sell reactors to mm -hmm. China. And China had deep pockets to be able to afford them. That's how they took off. Mm -hmm. And now uh, the Chinese have also moved ahead to the stage of Chineseization of the reactors. You see, so this happened. Hmm. So they have gone through a different path as a result yeah. of their own uh, political, economic um, uh, disposition. Yes. So that has played a, a role yeah. in the comparison that you are, a uh, very major role in the comparison that you are looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a completely different trajectory, actually. Hmm. And, I, and I guess you're absolutely right, the, the timing of it. They jumped into it with very, very deep pockets. So in your opinion, what does it take to create a self-reliant nuclear industry? Is that an ambition desirable in India? Can you think of arguments of why we might not want to go down that route? How would you sort of think about this question? You see, um, if we have to have a large nuclear energy program, then the right thing is to do it uh, with a high level of uh, self-reliance. Mm. May not be 100%, but very high level of self-reliance. Otherwise, it will be like in the defense area where uh, we are importing very large amounts. Right now, India is one of the leading imports of defense equipment. Mm. And in a strategic area like uh, power production, uh, though it can be argued that you can, not all countries can be self reliant in every way. A large country with a potentially large program uh, should have 
its own internal capabilities. Now, what it takes to build up said France is that you require an industry to begin with, which itself is fairly comprehensive in general industry. And you also have to then transplant the nuclear capabilities on that. Yeah. Now, when we started our activities, we found, for instance, our general industrial development was somewhat uh, basic. You see, we only were making simple uh, items of machinery and equipment, and uh, not the uh, very highly demanding ones or using special materials or special technologies. Yeah. And so we had to uh, invest in uh, making of those uh, special requirements. So in some ways, we took a lead to the general industry in, in creating new pathways of uh, technological competence, which of course eventually has helped the country in um, uh, refining its industrial practices elsewhere too. For example, if you kept making good nuclear components, you can make good components of fertilizer plant, and then you could also get export orders and things like that. So. Uh, a, a high level of uh, uh, self reliance in our case was also warranted because of the relative isolation that we have lived through. Hmm. Now, if you ask the question, why should we try to be self reliant in nuclear technology? Why not keep importing? You see, you must remember these are all uh, high investment activities. Uh, you, you invest. Uh, uh, in nuclear energy, is a high investment activity. You do not want vulnerability. You would like to be able to service them. You would like to have the parts required for them that are refurbished. You would like to ensure that their avail availability is uh, high uh, in terms of you being able to utilize the assets. Otherwise, they will turn out to be uneconomic. So it is, in my view, uh, highly uh, desirable, you can say may not always be totally necessary, but an extremely highly desirable mm. objective to achieve self-reliance, yes. Hmm. Um, what was the most trying moment in your career while being part of the nuclear energy program? <laughs> Well, um, actually, one particular event I remember is that, uh, you know, we were uh, to commission our first uh, uh, India-built power reactor in Kalpakam. Uh, and uh, we had uh, invited the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to come to that function on the 23rd of July, 1983. And it so turned out early in the morning when the systems were being started up, uh, it was a fire that was reported from underneath the, uh, what we call the turbine casing. And uh, it was uh, not a large scale fire, but a fire all the same. And uh, so then we got very worried because so why there is a fire at this time, especially very close to the startup. Of course, then it was turned out that during the construction activities, a fair amount of uh, cotton waste called rag, you know, is used for cleaning and all that, which had been soaked in oil, had been left uh, carelessly, left in the compartment below the turbine. And there was a small steam leak in that uh, at a high temperature, and that set fire to that. So the flame fire uh, broke out. Uh, but then the uh, it was detected pretty early, and uh, uh, the man in charge of the activity at the time there, my name is Mr. Rao, MHV Rao. Rao. He was there in the plant site already, and he and I and others we went out and. Uh, put it out and of course found that it was not, not a serious matter and we could sort it out fairly quickly and be able to complete the task safely thereafter and to start the activity. So I would call it that was one of the uh, uh, trying moments. Uh, but of course there are other uh, points of time when uh, 
uh, operating installations require special care, special uh, difficulties arise, and you require to be, have, be able to um, set up uh, mock-ups of the particular problem that you have had, demonstrate uh, the solution to those problems, which may require remote handling equipment, remote cutting, remote inspection, all of that is part of nuclear technology. And that has to be learned, assimilated, and uh, that's been one of the strengths of the program. Okay. What has been your most memorable moment in your career in the nuclear uh, I would say that uh, when we built, started off our own first uh, reactor at Kalpakam in, in, on the 23rd of July, 1983, it was a very memorable moment, I still remember, because uh, we had been saying that, you know, we should be able to demonstrate to ourselves in the first place and to the world as a whole, mm -hmm. that we can design and build nuclear reactors of our own. Yeah. Thank you very much for taking the time to have this conversation this evening with me. Uh, and thanks, of course, to Ravi for organizing this and for Sharda to, you know, for having pushed for this. As we're all aware, um, the question of nuclear energy is a very contentious one in, you know, in, in, um, among the broader debates on science and democracy. It is one which requires a very, very concerted effort um, in dialogue, in understanding, in order to be able to take decisions that are both viable and desirable and necessary um, in a democracy. And at times those decisions might not be, uh, you know, uh, might not be acceptable to larger, uh, to, to, to a larger audience or to a smaller audience, et cetera. But, but a, a, a good dialogue is necessary and a, and, a, and a good understanding of the question is equally necessary. So I'm very happy for the opportunity to have had this conversation with yeah, you. Yeah, but, um, um, um... And John, I think uh, we forgot to take note of one fact that uh, in the emerging energy scenario, uh, renewable energy also play a very important role. Yes. Uh, both uh, solar and wind. And uh, quite rightly, we are in this country trying to put emphasis on development of solar and wind-based power also. Yep. And uh, the whole idea is that over a long haul period, we should uh, have decarbonization of the society. Mm. That is, we put out far less carbon into the environment. Of course, much has been done in terms of improving energy use efficiency in industry uh, and uh, in other activities too. And of course, that's an ongoing activity that must go on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in uh, the effort to decarbonize the economy mm. Uh, there is certainly a role for nuclear energy uh, and along with uh, renewable energy. So I think we have to see that we pursue all these options uh, to see that uh, 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 or either a shorter or a longer haul as, may, as the case may be, hmm. we reduce uh, the carbon emissions uh, on a per capita basis and a national basis uh, as a part of our global responsibility. Indeed, indeed. So with that, I will move over to questions from the audience. So I, excuse me, I will move over to the computer where I can actually questions coming in from the audience. Um, and do, where do I find them? I find them here. Yes. Uh, we have lots of questions. We have, um, right. So uh, many of them are compliments to you. Um, one, uh, T. Palani Kumar would like to know what is the current status of thorium-based reactors and uh, is there any prospect of a nuclear fusion reactor in India? Uh, I, Can I, you hear me? I can't hear you. Okay, let me yeah. try and... Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah, okay, excellent. So T. Palani Kumar would like to ask you what is the current status of thorium-based reactors and is there a prospect for nuclear fusion reactors in India? See, thorium-based systems uh, uh, come in the latest stage of the program 
after we have uh, accumulated enough fission material or fissile material to be able to start thorium systems. Thorium by itself is not a fissile material. And so it is going to be, continue to be a fuel of interest. Uh, but um, there is a lot of uh, uh, this science related to thorium utilization and uh, initial technology work that India has carried out. There is interest in India and other countries, some of the other countries also to utilize thorium, but it is still some distance away, I would say, in terms of actual uh, utilization. We, of course, are irradiating thorium uh, in our experimental reactors and also uh, in some of our power producing reactors for so what we call as flex flattening. And that is to be able to uh, collect some amount of uranium-233 to study its nuclear characteristics. Hmm. But that is still some time away. Now, with regard to uh, fusion energy, India is a partner in this international experiment. And right now, there's some reconstruction in, in France. Yep. But I think uh, the first set of experiments is still some few years away. And thereafter, uh, we have to prove the uh, viability of uh, the fusion systems. So it's an area of work, an area of interest that will continue to be there some time to come. So it's a little difficult to speculate at what point of time fusion reactors will become available. And it's, it's, it's an activity on which we are also a partner in the international system. So there are several people asking the same question, which is what is the future of fast breeder reactor technology um, in India? Uh, you know, we have um, initially built a, a small reactor, which is called the fast breeder test reactor that has operated over a number of years. That's a small reactor in Kalpakam. And another uh, larger reactor of 500 megawatts uh, has been uh, essentially completed and it's in the initial phase of startup in uh, Kalpakam. After that goes into operation, we expect will some more. And uh, uh, they do occupy an important role as we see it hmm. over a period of time. And uh, there's been interest around the world which has actually diminished in other, in other countries. Right now, Russians are still working on fast reactors. And of course, once we demonstrate that uh, of uh, course, uh, Koreans and Chinese are also taking an interest in fast reactors. Uh, the early interest that was there in some of the other countries, uh, in Britain and the United States, Wayne, uh, and uh, you now we have to see a new wave of interest emerges as a result of the experience in Russia and India and China and Korea and so on. Okay. So uh, there's T.R. Govindarajan, uh, who would like to know if India should revisit the three-stage nuclear program uh, or the three-stage nuclear energy program design and make changes. I couldn't hear you. Uh, do we need to revisit the three-stage program and make changes in it? Well, uh, the, it, it's basically a stretched out situation. Hmm. And we see a role now in the first stage not only for natural uranium reactors, but also for uh, uh, enriched uranium reactors. Initially, uh, we had uh, thought that we would only be depending on natural uranium reactors, but now we feel quite confident in considering enriched uranium reactors also. We also got a, a certain amount of enrichment competence now, which can be scaled up if there is a need. So I think uh, we are a little bit more relaxed than we were in earlier times about the enriched uranium hmm. reactors also. So, and both of them can support fast reactors. Okay. Um, there's, there's Vishnupant Misare, who was the former group director of LPSC uh, ISRO, who would like to know about uranium ore availability in Belgaum district and that somehow an import from Australia was preferred to the mining ores found in India, if, if you know if this is correct or not. Uh, will you repeat the question? Yeah, so um, the, uh, 
Mr. Misale says that that uh, India has preferred an import imported uranium from Australia over uranium ore found in Karnataka, in Belgaum district. So, is that well, correct? Um, and if so, why? No, actually, what's happening is that we are now importing um, uranium from um, uh, from Russia, from Kazakhstan from um, uh, Canada, so Canada is yet to supply, but uh, we will be getting supplies from uh, Kazakhstan for that matter, which is one of the important sources of uranium supply. And uh, um, the activity in uh, the, the ores of the, uh, in available in India are still uh, not as, uh, uh, rich as the ores that are uh, found in some other parts of the world. Hmm. Nevertheless, we are processing our own uh, low grade ores of uh, Jharkhand and in uh, Andhra Pradesh and producing uranium, which is supporting uh, a certain section of our reactors that are being fed with that. So um, uh, the arrangement with Australia is uh, still uh, as it were in the pipeline, we won't actually started receiving any uranium from Australia, but from Canada we have received. So uh, we look for uh, diversification of uh, supplies from other parts of the world, uh, both geographical and from political uh, orientation of the country. So again, we should try to reduce vulnerability of any, any particular source. Hmm. So there's someone who wants to know uh, what was the motivation for France, the United Kingdom and Canada to help India develop its reactor, reactors and rare earths programs? Well, you see, some of these countries in the early days, the program thought that uh, it was a, a market potential hmm. uh, that uh, over time India would build large numbers of reactors and that some of them would be able to export. Uh, now, uh, France did export reactors to South Africa and China and uh, Korea and so on. So they thought that India also uh, with a large uh, energy requirement uh, would be a country that could uh, do with the importation of reactors and so did Russia think. So uh, to an extent you can say it is the general uh, expectation of industrialized countries to develop markets where they are feasible. Hmm. Okay, so since you can still hear me, uh, this, can people hear us? No, yes, sir. they can. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Okay, so we are back. Um, there's G. Raghava who wants to know, what is the design life of a nuclear power plant? What do we do with the infrastructure after the design life is over? Do we completely abandon it or what, what else is done with it? Yes, um, you know, in earlier times, we were used to assign a life of about 25 or 30 years for the reactors. Hmm. But now we have found that in reality, they last much longer. Uh, if they are properly looked after, uh, maintained properly. Uh, for example, our Tarapur reactors have completed 50 years of operation. Hmm. And of course, they are uh, assessed for their safety and integrity uh, periodically, uh, but they have operated for 50 years and some of the uh, 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 reactors in US also have operated for quite long periods of time. So uh, it's not, uh, that they will be required to be abandoned after a relatively short operating life. Now, after a reactor has been uh, utilized and uh, its uh, useful life is over, we do what's called as a decommissioning, hmm. where the uh, highly radioactive uh, internal parts are taken out and uh, uh, much of the uh, area of the station is decontaminated and only a very small amount of the highly radioactive uh, uh, remaining part 
is then encapsulated and kept in a safe manner. So this is not a very uh, serious matter. Uh, it's rather like, for example, some naturally occurring high radiation areas, which have to be kept away from uh, to see that uh, doses that human beings receive is uh, not uh, high. So uh, it's a manageable thing, but we've got to manage the, uh, uh, the final uh, radioactive waste that is emanating from the decommissioned reactor. We charge for the power produced a certain decommissioning charge so that we build up a decommissioning fund to finance the decommissioning the reactors. So next question from uh, Vijay Raghavan Rajagopalan follows in fact exactly from your answer where he would like to know um, what are the um, arrangements made for nuclear waste disposal in India and how is it being done and is there is there a research and development backing for um, waste management? Well, you see at the present time uh, our total waste range are not uh, very large hmm. and uh, we have foreseen uh, a scheme whereby the end waste is uh, the highly active long lived waste is separate, segregated, and uh, is we are made into immobile uh, form of uh, substance, usually vitrified, uh, that is to say, rather like a glass substance which doesn't leach which doesn't uh, uh, get mixed up with the environment, with water and all of that. And then the uh, vitrified waste is then encapsulated in uh, uh, impermeable stainless steel canisters. Um, human beings or animals and so forth. Hmm. Uh, uh, in uh, Sweden and in Finland, they have already created certain long-term storages, you see. Yep. And uh, the period of time when we have to think of putting up a long-term storage is yet to come. Hmm. And we are confident in this large landmass, we will be able to find a geological repository where the waste can be stored safely. Hmm. Uh, the sorry, could I just quickly look at the next question? The um, next question uh, again from Manji Raghava, uh, who says that Belgium, Germany, Spain, and Switzerland have planned nuclear phase outs. Italy has permanently closed all of its functioning nuclear plants. What is the argument, the main argument behind these decisions? And is there a similar line of thinking in India at all? And if not, why? Well, um, you, you can say, of course, that uh, some of these countries have phased out, but then there are other countries that are continuing to build and operate nuclear power stations like uh, the United States, like uh, Russia, like France, like China, uh, South Korea, they're all building. And even some of the newer countries like Turkey is building. So um, the issue is one of uh, energy security hmm. uh, and, and um, uh, the also it's one of the perceived uh, uh, risk that is being carried by continuing with nuclear technology. I think the risk that is uh, there associated with nuclear technology is far less than the risk involved, let's say with uh, you know, large scale use of coal, which pollutes the air, uh, large scale use of other petroleum products again pollutes the air. Uh, and even, Compared to, uh, for example, large dams, sometimes they, they breach, you see, and uh, they do create uh, accidents. So, of course, it's, the argument is not that there should be accidents, but that uh, there are risks with various activities, 
and you should, you should know how to manage the risk. So if one, if you were to take a view that would take zero risk, then the best thing would be to do nothing at all. So <laughs> that's not an option that's available. So there's a big expectation in countries like India for a ramp up of our uh, uh, use of energy because right now our energy consumption levels are very low. Hmm. And to supplement the energy input to the economy, we need to use all available options, including nuclear. Okay. Uh, so there, there's a comment from uh, Professor Dinesh Srivastava about the comment that I made about the variable energy cyclotron, but I'm sure I can take that up, up with him later. Uh, there's Shailaja Fennel asking, in a world of renewable energy, there is still a considerable role for rare earth minerals with regard to chip technologies. Should India be focusing on investment in increasing our capacity in these areas um, as a part of you know, the next phase? Well, I think we are placing a great deal of emphasis on renewable energy, undoubtedly. Hmm. As you know, that uh, the present government is very keen on uh, expanding renewable energy, and I think it's a good thing to be done. Um, but the, I would say renewable energy also has certain limitations. Hmm. It's uh, uh, non continuous, depends on vagaries of nature. For example, uh, solar is not available during periods of uh, high uh, uh, cloudiness, uh, rainfall, hmm. uh, wind is sometimes not available. So it's not that you can expect to generate. Uh, these renewable sources on a 24 by 7 basis. Hmm. So the big argument in favor of nuclear is that once you've got a reactor going, it can keep going with high uh, capacity factors. We also have been able to increase uh, nuclear reactor capacity factors very high. We've been running them for a very long period of time continuously. As a matter of fact, right now, some of our Indian reactors are some of the longest running continuously running reactors in the world. So when you are managing them properly, they run reliably for a long period of time and produce electricity on a reliable basis. So mm -hmm. you will need that also. You can't only have total renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Though of course, the renewable energy components certainly go up, but we require additionally uh, a continuous production of energy from some other source. Mm -hmm. There's someone asking, uh an interesting question. What is the prospect of privatization in the area of nuclear energy production? Is this, in your opinion, desirable? Um, and do you see this happening? Well, as of now, India has uh, developed uh, the uh, program up to this point on the basis of uh, state ownership and state control. Mm -hmm. Uh, this has been the experience also uh, in some of the countries which have had successful programs. For example, uh, in France, it has been the experience, and they continue to do it that way. Now, in Britain, initially it was a national program. Then, of course, it has gone through privatization and didn't actually help them uh, because of uh, fragmentation of control. And uh, so there was. Uh, uh, in a sense, it became necessary for, for Britain to depend on other uh, reactor building countries to build. Uh, for example, France has built some, uh, is, is considering building some reactors in uh, UK, and China is building, uh, considering building some reactors in, in the UK. Now, in India, we have a large involvement to the private sector in that we make them our uh, partners in, in supply chain of equipment of various kinds. That has been going on, it's going to be intensified. And that's the way they're going. And I think as we go along, we'll try and involve them in a uh, bigger way uh, in, in the supply of large packages for the nuclear plant hmm. and see how things go. And uh, it is one of these emerging scenarios. We'll have to watch and see how things develop over a period of time. Okay, so Professor Dinesh Srivastava has a, has a question for you, which is, uh, might you be able to say a little about accelerator-driven subcritical systems? 
But there's also been an area of interest in, 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 in uh, some parts of the world, mm -hmm. uh, called the ADS, Accelerated Room System, where you have a so-called subcritical assembly, which is initiated by accelerators. Again, uh, it's an area of uh, research and development. One has to develop the high energy proton accelerators, of, uh, attractive economics, and uh, uh, demonstrate them. Uh, uh, this, this, this technology is receiving study, no doubt. But for the time being, the concern has been to develop the available technology that has already been the way developed to a large extent to improve them, to make them cost effective, to make them reliable. So I think uh, these alternative paths will continue to be explored. Mm -hmm. uh, Srinidhi Kulkarni would like to know if India is actively prospecting for geological storage sites to for spent nuclear fuel. Yes, that is an exercise which is going on, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think we have, there are, there are many more questions, but some of them are repetitions of each other. So I think with that, we come towards a close for this evening. So I would like to thank you very much again for this opportunity to have this chat with you and, uh, over to Ravi. Okay. So Ravi has allowed me the pleasure of closing this evening. Okay. I will do that. I will slowly take my place on the stage and say thank you everyone, those in the audience patiently listening to us and those at home listening to us as well. I trust we all learned a little more about what lies behind these massive programs and also perhaps um, got, uh, got to hear about arguments um, that should be discussed more. Um, as we move ahead with the program or perhaps in other directions. Um, so thank you again for this evening. Well, thank you, Janu. It's been interesting talking to you and uh, trying to share uh, my experience uh, with you and the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.